So okay. close to the end of John chapter 17, we were down, we covered, oh, I think it was around verses 22, 23 last time, where Jesus yeah. talked about giving us his glory. And also, this, I think it's about the third week in a row where he, we were talking about unity, how, how important Jesus said for us to be unified so that the world would know that, that the Father sent him. And we, we had a little discussion after class last time about, about love. Um, and I thought maybe it'd be a good time to review that and to, just to define, maybe define what God means when he talks about love, because there's actually in the Greek language that, you know, the majority of the New Testament is written in the Greek language, and it's much more robust than the English language. If the English language has one word for love, and we use the same word love for the love for our spouse, our love for chocolate, our love for our children, our love for our brothers in Christ, our love for the lost, you name it, we only have one word for it. But the, the Greek language has at least four words for love that I know of. Um, eros is is one. It's That's uh, a romantic love. That's the love that we have for our for our spouse. That's where we get the word erotic. Um, it's a it's perfectly appropriate between a husband and wife. The the first it, and that's that's an emotional kind of love. Uh, the second type of love in the Greek language is storge or storge, depending on how you want to pronounce it. That's the kind of love for a a parent and a child, and uh, that's also an emotional kind of love that's a protective kind of love um, and you see that even in the in the animal kingdom um, probably the best example i can think of is the a mother bear and her cubs sure. you, you don't want to you don't get between a mama and her cubs she's sure. going to do whatever she has to do to protect protect those babies and that's the kind of love that a, that a mother has for her her children and, and any of you ladies out there that have had children, I'm sure you can relate to that. It's a special kind of love between a parent and a child. And as a, what, when the children are young, it's, you know, it's a unilateral, it's a one directional love, the, the, the parent towards the child, but as the child matures, it becomes a, a reciprocal love where the, the child begins to love the, the parent in the same way that the parent loves the child. And to the point where, um, when as the parent ages and the rules are reversed, you know, the, the, the child has the protective love for the parent. And any of you who've cared for your elderly parents, you certainly can appreciate that as well. And uh, so those are two kinds of love. Those, those are both emotional loves. The third type of love in the Bible is called, it's phileo, which is a brotherly affection. And that's where the, 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 city of philadelphia got its name the city of brotherly love that's also an emotional love it's a, it's a it's a brotherly attachment a brotherly affection i guess you'd call it brotherly affection and uh the fourth the fourth kind of love in the bible is the highest form of love and it's independent of emotion it it could it could be emotional or, but it doesn't have to be. that's and that's agape love that's the kind of love that god has for us it's an unconditional um kind of love that wants the best for the other person whether they deserve it or not and that's that's the love that god has for us we did not deserve his love in fact while we were yet enemies we were sinners he loved us and he demonstrated that love on the cross when while we were enemies that christ died for our sins so that's that's the highest form of love and it's the those last two forms of love that are that are mentioned so uh, frequently in the in the New Testament, it's the phil phileo, Philadelphia brotherly kindness. That's an emotional love, and agape, which is unconditional love, and that that's apart from that can be apart from emotions. And uh, agape love is not something that you and I can can muster up. It's the it's foreign to the world. The world does not know what agape love is. It, it's uh, it's well, let's let's go to John or not John. Let's go to Romans chapter five as an example. Romans chapter five says, start at verse, say verse five. Romans five. Yeah. Okay. This is talking about how we're justified by faith, 
We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ and talks about trials and so forth. And then he says about the hope that we have, verse five, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. That's agape love. That agape love is poured out in through into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. So it's only someone who has the Holy Spirit that can have this agape love. And now he'll, he'll go on, Paul go on, and he'll explain that agape love. He said, while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. That was us. That's dying for the ungodly. It says, verse 7, for one will hardly die for a righteous person, though perhaps for the good man, someone would dare even to die. And if you've ever shared the gospel with a skeptic, you'll hear, you might hear someone say, oh, well, you know, a lot of people have died. You know, there's nothing unique about about jesus a lot of people have died for others and they'll give example of firemen or soldiers things like that and that's true there, a lot of people have laid down their lives but as paul says here in verse seven you'll you'll barely die for a righteous person even maybe for a good man you would dare to die but how many people other than jesus have laid down their life for a for a sinner for a, a wretched person who who would lay down their life for an adolf hitler for a, a murderer, for a rapist, for a child molester. No, no one in their right mind on a human basis would do that, but only God would do that because of that agape love. That's the unconditional love that's willing to sacrifice yourself for the ultimate good of another person. And it's not necessarily emotional. And he says, God demonstrated his own love towards us and that while we were Yet sinners, Christ died for us. And in verse 9, much more, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Verse 10, while we were, we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So agape love is willing to make sacrifices even for someone who's your enemy. And again, that's something the world can't do. And But the phileo, the Philadelphia love, that's a brotherly affection. That's a that's an emotional type of love. It's more from the heart. The agape love is more from the head. It's more of a a, a moral uh decision of the will. And I, th I think Tony, I think you made made the comment, you know, you you want to try to love the the loss, but you find it difficult. And but but we're not, but but you're I think what you're speaking of there is you're trying to uh, manufacturing is trying to conjure up some kind of loving feelings towards the lost. And, and we're, we're, we're not, God's not telling us to do that. He's telling us, even if you don't, even if you don't have warm, fuzzy feelings about the lost, we can still, um, we can still have agape love for them. We want what's best for them. Some, somebody could spit in my face, beat me over the head with a club I might not have warm, fuzzy feelings for them, but I can still have agape love for them. I still can forgive them. I can still be kind towards them. I can still share the gospel with them because I want them, I don't want them to see them spend eternity in hell. I want to do whatever, whatever I can to present the gospel so that they can be saved. And maybe, maybe then they would become my, my brother in Christ. And then I would have that, that, excuse me, that phileo type of love, that brotherly love that brotherly affection so i don't know if that helps if that makes any sense at all brother now, jim you're better than me <laughs> you're better than me because i would let them feel the mighty power as a powerful hand of god upon uh, them <laughs> yeah but but that, that's me you know that's something that i have to work through and you know and hearing this type of thing you know knowing that i have to do as uh, as God says, you know, towards people like that. Um, who would do you like that? Mm -hmm. I, you know, it's just uh, it, it was. It all has to do with the way I grew up yeah. and the environment I, you know, and it's mm -hmm. kind of to get past that. Yeah, and you know, none of us have arrived. I mean, I can't tell you that I, you know, want to go up and you know love every person that mistreats me. But because God has been so generous with me, he's been so kind to me, so patient with me when I was a you know, wretched sinner, you know, that that allows me. And because he's poured that love into my heart, that allows me to be kind to someone who's 
mistreated me. I can, and above all, I want to see them come to, to trust in my savior and then they can be transformed and then they'll become a new creation. They'll be my brother in Christ. They'll uh, we'll be with them rather in heaven. Amen. So, I also thought about John 10, 18, when Jesus said, you know, he willingly gave his life. Yeah. For us, when you talked about like some people can argue that, you know, firemen give their lives or, um, you know, police officers, all that, but they get paid for that. True. They don't, mm -hmm. they don't do it unless they get a check. Yeah. Jesus well. did it. Jesus <laughs> did it for free. He, he paid an incredible price, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. But I mean, he, he didn't get paid for it. Yeah. Yeah, that's hard to handle. Say that again, Jim. I, you were cutting out. He knew it from the beginning. That's mm. what's hard to handle. Amen. Yeah. And that, and that was the purpose he came. That's the reason he came to earth. Imagine how difficult that must have been to make that decision. He, he knew whenever he was going to become a, a baby in the in the womb, that that's what he was coming for. That's boggles my mind that he was willing to make that sacrifice. Leave the yeah. heaven. When when we get to John chapter twenty one in a couple of chapters here, we're going to see that another example of the difference between that, that agape love and that phileo love. It, uh, it's going to be. Do you remember whenever G, Jesus restored Peter? Remember Peter made this statement. He said, "You know, Lord, I'll never deny you, even if ever, even if everybody else." runs away he said i'll never leave you i'll go to my death for you and jesus said you know peter you, you know you really don't know what you're saying he said you know before the cock crows three times you're or before the cock crows you're going to deny me three times and that's where he prayed he said satan has desired to sift you like wheat but i prayed that your faith would not fail but anyway and we saw that you know in spite of his best intentions peter did deny the lord when it came down to either saving his own skin or saving the you know, the life of his savior, he he did deny Jesus just like every one of us would do in, naturally. And but when Jesus restored Peter, do you, do you remember what he said to Peter? He, he said, Peter, do you love me more than these do? And he said, that's agape love. He said, do you have a, agape love for me more than these others? Because remember, Peter made that that statement. He says, even if all the others fall away, I won't. So Jesus is challenging him. He said, Peter, you know, do you really love me more than these others, just like you said you did, that, that agape love. Do you remember what Peter's response was? No, I do. He said, Lord, you know that I love you, but but the love, but what we'll, we'll see that when we get to chapter 21, but P Peter said, Lord, you know that I have phileo love for you, brotherly affection. He couldn't, he, he was humble enough by this time that he couldn't say, I have the sacrificial love that's going to put, put your needs ahead of my own because he knew that his flesh had failed, that he, he, he did not at that point did not have that kind of love that was willing to sacrifice himself for his savior. And Peter asked him again, he said, Peter, do you have agape love for me? And Peter again said, Lord, you know that I have this brotherly affection for you. And and, P and Jesus finally said, Peter, do you even have a brotherly affection for me? And that's when Peter really broke down. But we did, we do see after Pentecost, when Peter was, after he was born again, he received the Holy Spirit, the love, the agape love of God was poured out into his heart. And then he did have that agape love for Jesus. In fact, you, you, anybody know how Peter died? Um, upside down. He, he was crucified upside down. He was willing to go to his death for his savior. And he didn't even, he did not consider himself worthy to be crucified the same way as his savior. So he, he insisted that he'd be crucified upside down. So he did finally have that agape love. It was only because of the Holy Spirit had poured that love out into his heart. It's not a love that you and I can conjure up. And it's not even necessarily uh, emotional. But the, but the brotherly love that we're told to have for one another, that is uh, an emotional, it's, a, it's, it's of the heart. And well, let's, let's look at a couple verses there. Um, it, that, that word phileo, it's, it's almost always 
translated as brotherly affection or some kind of brotherly love. There's there's one place where it's actually referred to, it's translated as kiss. And what's interesting about that, do you want to, anybody want to take a guess where it's referred to as a kiss? Judas. Judas. In in Luke chapter, what chapter is that? Luke chapter 22, in the Garden of Gethsemane, when when he betrayed Jesus, it, it says that he how did it put that? He says he he approached he approached Jesus to express brotherly affection with a kiss. That's that same phileo, the same word that's used for brotherly affection. So that was a way to to express that phileo love was with a kiss. And Jesus replied back and says, "Are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss, with yeah. brotherly affection?" And that that word it it's it's also it's uh, philema which is another form of that word, which is translated as a holy kiss. And that's used, I think it's like five times in the, in the epistles. It says, greet one another with a holy kiss. It's, it's twice, it's in first and second Corinthians, Romans, Thessalonians, and Peter, where each one of those says to greet one another with a, with a holy kiss that's philema that's that's a way to show brotherly affection now mm -hmm. we we don't do that so much today but we'll we'll you know we'll hug one another we'll shake hands or whatever and uh and some of us may kiss on the cheek or whatever but anyway it's it's a way to express brotherly affection and uh one let me go to a couple more passages here romans 12 talks about that brotherly affection that that phileo love Romans 12 says, be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love. That's that phileo. Preferring one another above yourselves. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, I think, is one of the clinchers. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 9 says, concerning brotherly love, you do not need me to write this to you because you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. So that's something that that God teaches, he puts into our hearts that we have this brotherly affection one for another. And that's why James says that that's how we know that we've crossed over from death to life because we have this brotherly affection. We have this love for the for the brethren. And Paul, all of Paul's epistles, almost all of them, he mentions faith in Jesus and love for the brethren almost in the same breath in the numerous epistles that two go hand in hand faith in Christ and, and love for the brethren. So I don't know, does that, that help at all? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Yep. Because uh, like Tony said in the beginning, he needs help with his love walk, right? Yeah. And so we just learned that the Holy Spirit has to help Tony. Amen. Something that he can do on his own. That was that was awesome, Elder Jim. Amen. Yeah. And and when Peter even addresses that, Tony, in it's the second Peter chapter one, when he's talking about our character. So let me let me go there real quick. Second Peter chapter one. Oh, let's start in verse. Uh, let's see. Well, starting in verse three, he talks about <clears throat> second Peter chapter one, verse three, he talks about his divine power has granted us everything that we need for life and godliness. And that comes through the true knowledge of the one who called us to his own glory. So yeah, the more we, more time we spend in God's word, the more we come to know and appreciate our God and our savior, everything that we need, he's going to give us. And so verse four, he has granted us his precious and magnificent promises so that we can become partakers of the divine nature so that his nature, his nature becomes more and more prevalent in our life, just like the fruit. Basically, that's the fruit of the spirit. You know, his divine nature is going to be expressed through us. And he wants us to be partakers of that, es having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Now, here's verse five and six the, and seven are the verses I wanted to get to. For this very reason, apply all diligence. So we have to be diligent in, in your faith. It has to start off with faith in Christ. Supply moral excellence, and in, in the moral excellence, knowledge, and in knowledge, self-control. A lot of these are similar to the fruit of the spirit. 
self-control, that's one of the fruit of the Spirit. In your self-control, perseverance, and perseverance, godliness. And then here in verse 7, look at verse 7. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness. That's that phileo, that's that Philadelphia, that's, that's that brotherly love for one another. And then look at the last one. And to the brotherly kindness, love, that's agape love. So the greatest, the, the final is agape love. So, you know, that's something, it, it may not come right away. That may be, uh, you know, it may take a while before God builds that in, into us as a, as a regular occurrence. But, but it's a greater, it's showing here that's an even greater love than the brotherly, brotherly kindness. It's agape love. So is that helpful at all? Very all right, great. Yeah. Praise God. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, hmm. that means keep adding to. Amen. Keep they going, keep sister. you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Wow, that is awesome because I've been praying that, you know, God would open up uh, his word to me. You know, that uh, I would have understanding, right? And so if I do those things up above. You will be fruitful and productive. No. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, that ties back to our study of John 15, doesn't it? Abiding in the vine. That's how we become mm -hmm. fruitful. Abiding in the vine, abiding in Christ. And when we do abide in him, we're, we're going to bear fruit, the fruit, some of the fruits listed there, some of those character qualities, be fruitful and productive, we're gonna, and we're going to share this good news with others. Yes. And you know, the older I get, the more I want this, the more I want him, you know, because I'm getting older now, mm -hmm. like the last leg for me you know i mean i'm not getting ready to die but you never know never you know i mean i'm a seasoned senior <laughs> a seasoned you're senior. like you're on medicare so i've been thinking about these things mm -hmm. hallelujah yeah mm -hmm. i need him more right mm -hmm. the closer i get to the heaven or the end i want to make sure you know you know that saying that you know long we the more we lean toward christ the more we know that wisdom comes with age if we don't then wisdom will come alone mm, yeah <laughs> oh god y'all make me cry lord mercy holly fine too kim stop <laughs> <laughs> All right. Every hour I need thee, Lord. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Every hour. I find myself saying that more often than yeah. often. Yeah. Me too. Mm -hmm. Oh, jeez. Near to home. Yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And sometimes when you're young, you know, you just don't realize it, right? I, I just find it funny. You know, people. a lot of people send me stuff and stuff, and it's like, you've already, you've when you're old, you kind of know it, right? But you just, I remember one lady, I was young and I was a new Christian and she was an old, we called her Aunt B. And, you know, I said, oh my God, it's it's like beautiful to, to be saved, you know? And she just laughed at me and said, yeah, it pays to save Jesus. But she had served him for a long time. So it wasn't like I was telling her anything new, you know, she walked it. And the older you get, it's like, yeah, I want, yeah, but you don't want to discourage somebody young who right. thinks that they know so much. So, mm -hmm. but God is just good. Amen. Amen. I'm just getting into my old self. Mm -hmm. on that. Well, there's not, nothing like the enthusiasm of a new believer. Just, yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. But I always want to keep that too, you know? Uh -huh. yeah. Absolutely. And so I think some people think that I'm a new believer because <laughs> of the way I behave, but every day is new for me in him. You know, I never want, I, for some reason, it just doesn't get old. Amen. It's just new to me. 
mm. everything, mm. even though I know things. It's just like, he's wonderful, right? Mm. We look through different eyes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, last thing. Yeah, the word is alive. It grows. So what I might have saw 10 years ago or 20 years ago, it's like, what? I didn't know that was in there. Mm. Well, yeah, it was always in there. You just didn't see it. Yeah. <laughs> Reading it again for the first time, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can relate to that for sure. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, just last you talk, you were talking, Kim, about you know, uh, just feeling like a new believer. I, I just recorded my testimony last Thursday. You know how they're recording testimonies at, at church. I just re recorded that Thursday, and I don't know. It was just like being saved all over again. It, I it was. I don't know. It's it just interesting just going through all the same emotions that you did when when the lord saved you so, but anyway that's beautiful i'm looking forward to seeing it because we should keep that fresh in our minds we should yeah yeah all right well you're doing yours on this wednesday aren't you kim or is it something different well i guess we'll find out wednesday won't we <laughs> well i'm giving a testimony i'm giving them okay. About I'm going to talk about prayer though. Okay, all right. Well, I'll look forward to it. I gave my testimony before. You weren't there, I don't think. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I guess I wasn't. Oh yeah. Hmm. Oh well. All right. So where are we? Are we in question thirty nine? Is that where we are? How will the world know the Father sent Jesus? Down oh. verse twenty three. Does that sound familiar? Yes. All right. Somebody want to read verse 30, uh, I'm sorry, verse 23. We're, we're in John chapter 17 now, verse 23. Somebody read verse 23. John 17, 23. Yep. Reading out of the EVS, ESV. Mm -hmm. Okay. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them, even as I, as you loved me. All right. So, again, Jesus is praying that we would be one. This time he says perfect or perfected in unity. I'm not sure what your translation might say, but yeah, be in perfect unity or perfected in unity. And what's the reason for it? What what would be the result if we're perfected in unity? So that people would know that uh God sent him. Yeah. People would know the Father sent him. So yeah. that he'd know, yeah, he's the Messiah. Because that's what it was about, right? They were waiting for the Messiah, the Jewish people. Yeah. Yeah. So again, how important it is for us to be unified, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Being one Lord, one faith, one Father, one baptism, one one God and Father of all, over all, and you know, mm -hmm. having that same purpose, glorifying God, sharing the gospel. All right. And that happens. How does, how does that happen? I in them and you and me. So it ha has to be Christ in us, doesn't it? It's, we're certainly not going to be unified without having Christ in us. And of course, the Father is in, in Jesus. We, we know that. He said, I and the Father are one. So if we have Christ in us, it says we may be perfected in unity. So that the world would know the Father sent Jesus. Uh, let's see. Next question. How will the world know that the Father loved disciples just as he loved Jesus? How will the world know that the Father loved the disciples? That's question 40. Same verse. Because Jesus is in them. Having they have unity. Yeah, that, that's what I would say. Yeah, because because Christ is in us and we have unity. Because we believe. Okay, I went to John seventeen. 
uh, oh, 24, Jesus is praying for us for our salvation. 26, because we believe. Am I going down too far? Let me see. Um, well, I was only looking at verse 23, but if you. Okay, right. If All right, never mind. Will help, that would be fine. But yeah, I'd say it's by the unity of the disciples, wouldn't, wouldn't you? Anybody see anything different there? How the world will know the Father loved the disciples just as he loved Jesus. Because his spirit is within us? Yeah, I'd say so. Because he's in that same verse, he says, because I'm in them and you're in me. So yeah, but his spirit in us. I would agree with that. I mean, he gave us his breath to give us life. Amen. Yeah. That's him. That's, that's part of the spirit. Yeah. Amen. His spirit's in us, and we're going to have the love for one another as well. We're going to have unity. One, one purpose. And also, my um, when reading it, it took me to chapter 5, John chapter 5, 20, where it says the but for the father loves the son and shows him all that he is doing mm. and greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel. So greater works will we do that than what Jesus did, right? Mm -hmm. So that's how they'll know. Uh, what is the question? How will the, how will the world know that the father loves his disciples? Because we're doing the work. Okay maybe i mean but okay. it took me to 520 chapter 5 okay all right it says the father loves the disciples even as he loved jesus that that's something to think about isn't it mm -hmm. what kind of love did the father have for his son his only begotten son i think that was a pretty special love He yeah, he says that he loves loves us, even as he loved Jesus. Remember, he was to just my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. I don't know. Can we? And know. he loves us just as much. That's what you're saying. It sounds like he has the same love for us as he has for the son, doesn't it? He sure does, Elder. He sure does. I don't know if I can fully fathom that. I know. That's what I'm like sitting here amazed, like how he loves me as much as he loves Jesus. How awesome is that? Can't beat that with an ugly stick. Well, I'm telling you right now. That's the best kind of love. For I, I feel fortunate. I feel fortunate and blessed. I mean, unworthy, really, because, mm -hmm. you know, but, you know, I truly grateful that he loved me like that no. which gives me hope for salvation yeah amen it's overwhelming isn't it overwhelming wow well, i get excited Ugh, to think the creator of heaven and earth hmm. that everything that owns everything loves us if he showed his love for jesus he showed us how he loved Jesus, and he loves us just like that. Mm. Yeah. My heart is filled. Amen. Yeah. Undeserving as we are, he still loves us. Yeah, that's the big thing. Mm. All right. So who gave the disciples to Jesus, according to verse 24? The father father right so, said you gave them to me and look what he says after that he gave you gave them to me for what or to be with me didn't he mm -hmm. to be with me where i am he says we're going to behold his glory oh. i often think of that what what's going to be like when we finally see jesus in all his glory I, just like that song i can only imagine 
Will I even be able to stand? Hmm. He wants us to be with him wherever he is so that we can behold his glory. That same glory that Jesus had with the Father, the Father had given him. When did the Father start loving the Son? Before the foundations of the world. Before the foundation of the world. From eternity past, I would guess that means what, doesn't it? That's something else that's hard for me to fathom. Hmm. I can I can almost grasp eternity future, but eternity past, I I I don't I don't know, I can't I've never been able to comprehend that and I probably never will. Amen. I can remember as a kid asking my mother, you know, well, you know, when was God born? He always was. And I, I, I just couldn't comprehend that. I still can't. <laughs> you know what? I wonder sometimes if I may say, um, did Jesus ever get mad at somebody? You know, did he ever have anger? I mean, like anger towards somebody or anything as a kid? Did he ever get angry? I mean, did he act like a normal kid or what? Or was he always, I know he was out teaching yeah. as a kid. We we have, but, uh, yeah, we have a couple examples where he did have indignation. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. It, it was a righteous anger. In the temple is one place I can think of. Yes. I think there was at least one other place. I can't remember what, what the situation was off the top of my head. But but his anger, it was always a righteous anger. It wasn't like you and I, where we get angry with someone because they insult us or because we didn't get our own way. You know, Jesus never had that kind of an anger. His his was never a sinful anger. His was righteous anger. In the temple, remember his anger in the temple was because they had made his father's house. It was, he says, my father's house will be a house of prayer for all nations, but you've made it a den of thieves. He was angry for, I think, I, I think it was for two reasons. One, because they were preventing people from coming in to worship his father. They were, they were selling sacrifices and everything at exorbitant prices. So people that, that were coming from far away couldn't come in and, and worship. Plus, they were essentially desecrating his, his father's temple. They were turning it into a, a marketplace. So it wasn't, you know, Jesus wasn't angry because you know, somebody insulted him or because he didn't get his own way. It was a righteous anger because of his father's, for his father's namesake and for the sake of, of, of the people. He may have been in a situation as a young person, maybe where kids were bullying others or something, and he was righteously angry. Wouldn't surprise me a bit. Yeah. It would have been a similar situation. Yeah. He, he might have been angry for the sake of others. It would be an uh, issue where he could have had unrighteous anger. I could see it when he uh, was met with Judas in the garden. Oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> the opportunity was there. Oh, yeah. He, he didn't, but he it would, right. certainly would have been, <laughs> certainly would have been. Uh, Attempted to, wouldn't it? Wouldn't there have been attempted? Especially when to? knowing the beginning from the end, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And he even he even called Judas friend even to the end. Even mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Wow. Knowing what was going to happen. Hmm. What amazing love! Forgive them, Father, for you know not what they do. Mm. Boy, that would have been a perfect opportunity to be angry, wouldn't it? someone's pounding nails in your feet mocking you spitting in your face tearing out your beard for nothing when you committed no sin but yet said scripture says he did not answer a word kept silent like a lamb going to slaughter he kept entrusting himself to the one who judges justly that would be my prayer for each of us just trust ourselves into the one who judges justly. And not revile when we're in, in return when we're reviled. Amen. 
challenge, isn't it? Yeah. All right. Uh, I don't see you getting angry at anybody, Elder Jim. Oh, it happens. <laughs> okay, if you say so. It happens on occasion. You'll have, you'll have to ask my wife. I'm just waiting happen. for an amen. No <laughs> 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 <Hey>, comment. <laughs> uh, yeah, I wish I could say I never do, but don't we all? <laughs> then I'd be a liar too if I should. <laughs> all right, all right. So the Father gave the disciples to Jesus, and I think I answered question forty-two, but but we'll we'll ask that again anyway. Why does Jesus desire for the disciples to be with him? Verse twenty. That's in verse twenty-four. To see his glory that the Father has given him. Amen. So we can see his glory. Yeah, what a day that's going to be. So who gave Jesus his glory? Again, verse 24. The Father. Father, yep. And why? Why did he give it to him? Because he loves him. Yeah. Because he loves him. I wonder if that's why, let's see, I was just thinking back to the verse where Jesus said he, he's given us, let's see, well, he says, he's, he, verse 22, he's given us his glory so that we may be one. I would imagine his love for us comes into play there as well. But anyway, yeah, the father gave Jesus his glory because he loved him. And we already answered question 44. How long has the father loved the son? I think mm -hmm. you answered that one, Kim. It's the foundation of the world. Yeah. How did that that... Oh, go ahead, Jim. That question 43. Yeah. Who gave Jesus his glory? And yeah. the answer is God. Right. And then we go to Isaiah 42. And God says i i give my glory to no one amen yeah himself <laughs> amen. amen amen yeah that ties in the trinity doesn't it the de deity of christ amen thanks jim wow cool that ties in the trinity the deity of christ isaiah 42 what eight i think I think. Um, well, let's look quick. Forty-two eight. See if that's it. Yes, that's correct. Forty-two eight. All right. I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. So in question 25, how did, how did Jesus describe his father in verse 25? Righteous father. Righteous father. And I should have put a reference there to verse 11. Do you remember how he described his father in verse 11? John 17, verse 11. How did he describe his father? Holy. Holy. Holy, holy father. Uh, verse 11 holy father verse 25 righteous father so it's the holy father because he's set apart he's like no one there's no one like him verse 25 he's righteous righteous father of course there's nobody righteous like him he, the only way we become righteous is as a free gift when he imputes it credits it to us how did, bonus question how did he demonstrate his righteousness Give you a clue. One one way. It's, it's in Romans three. He shows how he demonstrates. Get, uh, he died for us. Yeah, yeah. Romans three. Let Let's read that. That's a excellent passage. Well, this is, this is a good uh, 
evangelistic passage if you're sharing the gospel with someone romans 3 uh it's around verse 25 well verse 21 start with verse 21 mm -hmm. says the righteousness of god has been manifested it was witnessed by the law and the prophets okay and it's the righteousness of god through faith in jesus christ for all those who believe and let's see let's go down to here here we go verse 25 is talking about Jesus, about the redemption that we have through his blood. God displayed Jesus as a, he displayed him publicly as a propitiation in his blood. And that propitiation, that means, it can mean an atoning sacrifice. It can mean uh, the one who satisfied God's justice. He's the propitiation in his blood through faith. And this, here we go. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. And he explains it, he expounds on it in 26. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So if you were to explain that to a lost person, what, what's he saying there? How did, how did that demonstrate God's righteousness? Do you remember the illustration of the of the judge? The difference between a, a righteous judge and an unjust judge or a, a corrupt judge? God demonstrated his righteousness through the death of his son because if he he couldn't just wink at sin, he couldn't just say, Oh, you're forgiven without having his son pay that price could he he would not be righteous otherwise it'd be like going into a judge say i've committed murder and the penalty is life imprisonment and the judge says oh it's okay i'm a kind and loving kind and loving judge you're free to go mm. yeah that would be nice for, for me but the rest of the world would be outraged wouldn't they say where's the justice what kind of righteousness is this that, that judge is corrupt in order for him to be righteous, that penalty has to be paid, doesn't it? Either I'm going to have to pay it or somebody else is going to pay it. God demonstrated his righteousness because Jesus paid the price. He was the propitiation. He satisfied God's justice and proved that God is righteous. So that way God can be, not only can he be loving and forgiving, he's also holy, righteous, and just, isn't he? He's righteous. He he was he upheld the law jesus fulfilled the requirement of the law he fulfilled all righteousness so that's how god demonstrated his righteousness does that make sense mm -hmm. all right maybe that'll be helpful sometime if you're sharing the gospel and someone can't understand why jesus had to die in order for them to be forgiven and it's because god is righteous jesus had to satisfy god's righteousness All right. So question 46, does the world know Jesus? No. no. Nope, not at all. They might know about him, right? Most, most, well, I don't even know if I could even, if I could even say most of the world knows about Jesus. It used to be everybody knew, at least knew about him, but I don't know. You hear stories about kids these days that don't yeah. even have no idea who, who Jesus yeah. is. We were just having a discussion about that yesterday where, you know, families don't go to church. They probably don't even have a Bible in their house and the children don't know. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, um, but, he, but even knowing about Jesus isn't enough, is it? No. I mean, we need to know him personally, but that's a start. I mean, you have to know, you have to know the facts about him first. But, you know, even as James said, even the devil knows the, the facts about Jesus. So there's a difference between knowing about him and, and knowing him personally and intimately. And, the, and remember back in verse three, Jesus said, that's what eternal life is, to know him, to know Jesus, to know the father and the son. And it's an intimate knowledge. It's, it's actually the same word. We might have covered this 
on verse three, but it's worth covering again. To know, to know him, it's it's an intimate word. It's a, to, to, it's an intimate knowledge. It's the same word when it talks about Adam knowing Eve, or it's when Joseph he did not know Mary until after Jesus was born. It's it's a a union to, to know him. It's it's a spiritual union similar to the physical union of a husband and wife. When a husband and wife have that physical union, the two become one flesh. And um, I think it's in Corinthians, it says, whoever joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. And Romans 7, 4 talks about it, talks about it again as a, in the relationship of a marriage. It says, whoever, let me, let me read that. It's Romans 7, 4. <clears throat> Romans 7, 4 says you were made, well, start at verse 3, talks about if a person's, if a wife, if her husband is living and she's joined to another man, she's going to be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, so she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. Verse 4, therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, that you might be joined to another, to him who is raised from the dead, that we might bear fruit for God. So we're joined to him. We're joined to Christ. It's a union similar to the union of a, of a husband and wife. It's a spiritual union. We become one spirit with him. So that's the, the knowing, knowing God, knowing Jesus, knowing the father and the son. We, it's that spiritual union. Our, our spirit has become one with his spirit. So it's more than just knowing the facts. It's knowing him intimately. Right. When we when we're born again, we're born again of the spirit. We become united. All right. How about verse or question 47? Do the disciples know that Jesus was sent by the Father? Verse 25. Yes. Yeah. Remember he said that back in the end of chapter 16. Let's see, what did he say there in 16? Um, verse 30, yeah, it says, it says, now we know that you know all things and have no need to, for anyone to question you. By this, we believe that you came from God. So they finally, they finally know that Jesus came from the Father, don't they? Know that he came from God. And remember, even Nicodemus, remember back in chapter three, Nicodemus said, we know that you came from God because no one could do the things that you you're doing unless he's sent by God. So Nicodemus had a clue back then, and we know that he did become a disciple as well. All right. So Jesus has known the Father, and these have known that you sent me. So they finally, was it, yeah, I think it was in chapter 16, I think, where Jesus said, Do you finally believe? Yeah, verse 31, 1631. Do you now believe or do you finally believe? Took them, what, three and a half years, but they finally believe. Yep. Slow, just like us, aren't they? Amen. <laughs> yep. All right. We're almost done. Why don't we go ahead and finish the last couple of questions? Um, Question 49, what does it mean to know his name? We're down to verse 26, last verse. It said, I've made your name known to them and will make it known. What, what does it mean to know his name? I mean, everybody knows his name, don't they? What, what, do, you, what do you think Jesus is, is talking about there? God is love. Yeah. Okay, God is love. To truly believe. Truly believe, yeah. And the love is in us. Amen. His love is in us. Yeah. And we display that love. Okay. We display that love as well. Yeah. Yeah, I've made your name known to them. And one remember another thing, you know, a person's name in, in the Bible is their character too, isn't it? You know, how every time, uh, I don't know if I could say every time, but how often we see the Lord changing someone's name. You know, we see Abram changed to Abraham, Sarai changed to Sarah, uh, Jacob 
changed to Israel. Peter was his name changed. Saul was changed to Paul. And and it's, and if you look and see what the name means, it's because of a change in character, isn't it? And so may, perhaps that's one of the reasons why God has so many names and Jesus has so many names. You know, Elohim, El Shaddai, because they're all explaining different aspects. They're they're describing different aspects of his character, aren't they? So. Mm. And, and Jesus made his name known to them. He he revealed he was the, the exact representation. He was God's perfect representation of God's character, wasn't he? he? He represented him perfectly. He didn't do anything unless the Father told him to do it. Didn't say anything unless the Father told him to say it. He's the perfect representation of his character. He made his name known to them. Who he is, his character, what he is, what he is like. His holiness, his righteousness. Amen. Right. Question 50. Why did he make his father's name known to them? And I think you pretty much answered that, Kim, but. So they would know the love God had for Jesus. Amen. So he revealed, basically revealed God's character to them, who he is. And the reason was so that they would know his love for Jesus. I mean, and God is love. I think one of you said that God is love. So it was, it was demonstrated God's love, revealed his his love, his character, his name. So that love would be in them. And that, of course, that love is in us once we believe, isn't it? So when we know his character, his love for us, and we believe it, we trust in it, we're born again. He pours out that love into our hearts. Man. <clears throat> trust in that great love he has for us he saves us by his grace all right so the last question how does this impact you <laughs> where do we start huh overwhelms us with gratitude for one thing doesn't it yes how about you tony how does this impact you well you know that um i have you know even though i said that that i have a hard time but you know i've been able to do to walk away and let things slide you know mm -hmm. um and just walk away from certain things. And then, uh, but then I'm beating myself up inside, you know, saying, man, I should have done this, this could have done that. But I think uh, that's the devil just talking to me there. Yeah, amen. And, uh, yeah. and I rebuke him in the name of Jesus, you know, so I, I'm able to call, I ask Jesus for peace mm -hmm. to give me, to try, you know, to calm that storm within me down, you know, the, because I know that it's possible, and I calm down. Mm -hmm. You know, Mary and I are going together, you know, we've been together for, you know, two years, going on two years, and not once have we had an argument, mm -hmm. you know, we, which is something saying for me, because me, I argue about everything. <laughs> and just, <laughs> you know, just for the sake of it. But uh, she's taught me, she's, She's taught me a lot, you know, and about myself and how to control myself, my emotions, my mouth, uh, and what have you, you know. Um, so, and the more that I hear about this, you know, because I know God expects this out of me. And uh, that's what, like I said, it from the first, since I first came onto this group, is that I'm trying to lead the righteous road. So I, I try to do the best I can to follow God's word. I don't always succeed. Don't get me wrong. I fail sometimes, but I get back up. And I don't let that devil keep me down. Yep. You know, I rebuke him. I rebuke him in the name of Jesus every chance I get when he tries to get in my way. Wow. And uh, he can't. He can't touch me. He Sorry. can't touch me. I got the Jesus all over me, baby. Yep. And that's the whole truth. Sounds mm. like an so you. Know, I, I'm going to get better at what I struggle with, yeah. but I'm, you know, I've accomplished a lot from, from where I began. 
Yeah. And I, I think I've come a long way, a long way. It's almost like an old 360 or 380, 180, whatever it is. Yeah, we'll go with a 180. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 360, yeah. you're going back the same way you came from. We'll go, we'll go with the 180. But, but yeah, you're, you're growing in grace, Tony. Not not one of us has arrived. So we're all we're all growing in grace. So, yeah, from, that's from, that's yeah. what's so exciting about being a Christian, you know? I'm not all I'm going to be, and, you know, we're, we're not, he's always helping us along the way and he will till that day we go to be with him. Amen. Yeah. Yep. If we think we've arrived, we're, uh, we're on unsteady ground. So, yep. Continue to grow in grace, continue to abide in the vine, allow him to continue to renew our mind and transform us. All right. Anybody else have anything to share? Joyce, what are your thoughts? How does this impact you? Well, I guess this chapter talked a whole lot about unity. So mm-hmm. this it must be very, very important mm. to the Father and to Jesus. And so yeah. I just, and we all need to just concentrate on that because we're selfish. It's natural to be selfish. And then it's hard to be in unity because we want our way instead of mm. anyway. So that was a big deal. Yeah, amen. Yeah, that's that's one of the things I really appreciate about our elder board at at Living Water. We uh, we we've been able to maintain unity, maintain the unity of the spirit. Um, we're not a bunch of yes men. We we have our discussions. We don't always agree, but at the end of the day, we're we're always unified. So it's, you know, you don't have to. We don't have to agree on every you know every little nuance of everything but we you know we we can still maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace all right anybody have anything additional to add anybody like to pray for us Well, Father, Father, I'm sorry. Nope. Go ahead, Tony. Go ahead, Tony. I'll begin with the Lord's Prayer. Okay. Our Father who art in heaven, holy be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. That is the power, the glory, and the kingdom, or something. I might have got that wrong. <laughs> and Amen. The power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Amen. Father, we ask that you be with us and help us, those who struggle with certain things, you know, give us the fruit of the vine so that we can. Uh, be able to be the way that you want us to be, Lord. Um, Heavenly Father, we ask that you be with those who are sick and couldn't make our meeting today, uh, to be with uh, the mother of the sister who went to the hospital. And whatever other problems we may have, Heavenly Father, may you put your healing hand upon us and and, uh, give us peace. Jesus' name, watch me. Amen. 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 Thank you, Tiny. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Hope you were all were as encouraged as I was. Very much so. All right. Well, praise God. Thank you. And we'll see you all next Monday with uh, Chapter 18, Lord willing. Oh. Hallelujah. God bless y'all. Love y'all. Bye bye. Have a blessed week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.